Welcome back, and I'm going to have Paul introduce uh, Ken, um, because they actually work together on many, many things, and so he's going to probably say other interesting things about our guest. And so for about the next 20 minutes or so, we will be having a conversation about many, many, many areas uh, affecting people with um, assorted disabilities. Okay, thanks, Diane. Um, uh, we'll be speaking to Ken Mitchell, who is the assistant director at Disability Link, um, which has an office in Tucker. Um, it's a center for independent living, and we're going to explain, talk about what that means. Um, Ken and I go back some years now, particularly around issues related to transportation and MARTA and the disability community, and MARTA mobility in particular. Um, but I think in general, as what we try to do here on the Labor Forum is talk about all the different issues that affect workers and uh, people with disabilities certainly are part of that constituency. So Ken, uh, welcome to the Labor Forum. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. And can you start by explaining uh, a little bit about what you do at Disability Link and what a Center for Independent Living does? Well, thank you, Paul. Um, of course, like you said, my name is Ken Mitchell. I'm the Assistant Director of Disability Link, which is a Center for Independent Living for Metro Atlanta. We cover the the 12 counties around Metro Atlanta, as soon as I can remember them all, uh, there's Cherokee, there's uh, Coweta, Cobb, Clayton, DeKalb, uh, Douglas, Fayette, Fulton, Rockdale, Newton, Henry, and Gwinnett. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We had a gold star with you. <laughs> and so, so what, what services and uh, advocacy do you provide? Right. So Centers for Independent Living is kind of unique uh, than any other uh, organizations that uh, work with people with disability. First of all, we're nonprofit. We are um, a non-residential. We um, are community-led. We're also peer-supported, and we're cross-disability. You know, so those things mean different things to different people, but uh, nonprofit basically means I don't get paid a bunch of money. <laughs> uh, community led is that uh, we're there. The, uh, each center is kind of um, controlled by the area that it serves. It kind of uh, is different from each area that it serves. In Georgia, there are nine different centers around Georgia. Um, cross disability is every disability. Um, there's no uh, uh, specific mental cognitive sensory uh, disability that's out there is every disability and peer-led which makes it most important and peer-led is um, kind of like a mentoring but it's uh, more on the same level S this particular point in time I may be uh, supporting you but some other time you may be supporting me and that's peer-led we're all on the same level it's not a mentor mentee but it's uh, on the same level. Or the medical model, which is like the expert and you're the patient or something. This right. is more, we're all we're trying all, to figure this out together. Right, we're all experts. It's kind of like the, the thing, it's one of the things I've said probably too many times to you, Paul, is that we are the experts in our own life, and I've heard you say that many times as well. So we, people with disabilities, are the experts in our own lives, and um, we, we kind of believe in that, and that kind of, we do believe in that. So um, we're uh, an organization that serves the Metro Atlanta, about half the population of Georgia at Disability Link. And there are also nine other, uh, correction, eight other centers throughout the state of Georgia. So before we move on, could you talk about the independent living philosophy? What is that about? <laughs> well, the independent living philosophy, uh, and then when we talk about independent living, it may be different than some others. I mean, many people will talk about, you say, well, I work for an independent living community. They may be thinking of a uh, senior citizen uh, residence. They may be talking about independent living skills, for instance, uh, oh, uh, uh, orientation mobility training, uh, learning to work with a cane, maybe how to use your uh, power chair uh, or how to cook or something like that. Those, are, in our opinion, are independent living skills. The independent living philosophy basically says that uh, ev everybody has a choice. We, right. we, we want to give you a choice of whatever you do, and uh, you are uh, responsible for the choices that you make. So, yeah. you have a choice, you are the expert in your own yeah, life, yeah, yeah. 
and you are responsible for the choices that you make, and we'll support you with that. Sometimes it's difficult uh, for our own self to say what they're making that choice, but it's their choice or our choice, and uh, we will support that. This is the labor forum program. So, one of the story about LC uh, that that I was reading yeah. before yeah, was say? an example of someone getting out of an institution in order oh, to live oh. independently. Yes, independently. yes uh, actually, it's a good story. LC, as you said, was an institution, and one of the things yeah, she kept saying is that I want to go home. I want to go home. And uh, you know, there were a lot of, and I put the quotation around, experts saying that uh, you can't go home because you won't make it. You can't go home because you won't be able to survive. You can't go home because how would you possibly do this or that? And they were the experts. But the expert was Lois. And uh, she said, I, I want to go home. I want to uh, live in the community. I want to be with my friends and neighbors. I want to uh, be with my uh, relatives. And I am a person and I, uh, I have that choice and an option to uh, live in the community and participate in the, less, the most least restrictive area. And the uh, ADA supported that. And that became a national, I mean, it was a Georgia case that became, had national implications. Right. Uh, so Elsie uh, took that to the Georgia Supreme Court and, uh, and lost. And, uh, and then she said, you know, uh, luckily, there's, with supports, was able to take it to the Supreme Court and uh, uh, won the case with the Supreme Court, which allowed uh, anybody uh, persons with disabilities to live uh, in the most in the least restrictive uh, area, which of course we would know that would be uh, in our own homes, in our own communities, with our own families and friends. Okay, so we want to move now into the area of employment. Um, so, the disability community, uh, can you give an overview of? what the unemployment rate is, what some of the obstacles are, and just in terms of the state of Georgia, where, where things stand. Well, <clears throat> depends on who you ask, and uh, the numbers would vary somewhat. But we would say now the unemployment rate for the United States is somewhere about 4.5, maybe the 4.9 uh, unemployment rate. But for people with disabilities, it's rather high. Uh, uh, whatever number you just thought you would, it would be, triple that. Well, people with disabilities are said to be about 70% unemployed. 70% unemployed people with disabilities. And what we say uh, uh, is that uh, many people with disabilities uh, would like to work, would want to work, and uh, have a sense of pride in uh, employment. I happen to be blind. Uh, and without supports, uh, I would probably be one of those people who would be uh, uh, somewhat uh, institutionalized uh, because um, I wouldn't uh, be able to go back and forth to uh, work or have some of the accommodations that I have at work. So can you explain about the Americans for Disability Act and what provisions are in that that support people's right to work? Well, the, uh, uh, and under the ADA, and actually under the Constitution, you know, that little part that says uh, the pursuit of happiness, well, uh, many people have, have that right. Everybody has a right, not many people, everybody has that right to pursue happiness. And one of the things that we know uh, brings uh, uh, a smile to anyone's voice is when they can pay for their own uh, meal, they can pay for their own uh, uh, ride, they can pay for their own church, they can pay for their own uh, housing and have the uh, right to, uh, to be in charge of that. And going back to my original thing, what I talked about earlier, that we want to have people to have options and choices. So with work, we, we, we get some more options and some more cho choices. There's no one telling us that we have to eat at 5 o'clock. There's no one telling us we have to go to bed at 9.30. There's no one telling us that we have to be in the house at 6. No one telling us, you know, whatever, 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 whatever. And so with a job or work, uh, we, um, people with disabilities, we have more options. And with those more options, we have more uh, choices. And with those more choices, we can make more decisions. So can you explain the difference between someone with a disability living 
on Medicare and someone with a disability on Medicaid. And we've been hearing some talk nationally about work requirements for Medicaid. But can you start with Medicare and what that looks like? Well, on all those systems, all those, those, uh, uh, all the choice waivers, there's, there's limitations. When we were talking about choices earlier, um, we talked a little bit about um, what that means for some people with disabilities. So, in some cases, uh, I may be under some kind of a medical plan, and under that medical plan, there are certain income limitation no, income limitations under those income limitations it may keep me under a certain cap let's just say um, thirteen thousand dollars a year that's what it is mm -hmm. <laughs> thirteen thousand okay. dollars a year and thirteen thousand dollars a year uh, is uh, a tough wage I know I was listening to earlier what the, about the the minimum wage being fifteen uh, dollars an hour uh, that's, that's a tough way to live in, in the economy that we are today. So, one of the income caps, uh, when you make over that, it's, uh, it may stop your medical care. And people with disabilities, uh, medical care is, is uh, extremely important and can uh, run without support into the um, uh, at least tens of thousands. So, uh, one of the things that people with disabilities uh, have to be careful about right now is to make sure they stay under the cap, because even with just you know hundred dollars over, you'll lose that uh, that care. And so, how is it different with Medicaid? It, it, I would, it's the same. It's, it's the, same. the same. It's the same. The cap may mean uh, different things to different people. Uh, the cap may vary, and with all the um, uh, sources of uh, um, insurance of certain types uh, about what you can and cannot do, um, uh, even with uh, some of the uh, the SNAP programs, uh, it may, uh, may differ. Uh, it's just that one of the things that we always try to work with is uh, benefit, uh, I don't know, I must need more water, <laughs> is a benefits navigator uh, so that uh, that person will support you or support people to navigate through all the, the, the different regulations so that uh, they can have the, uh, choices. And some people will choose to. Uh, to uh, lose their uh, benefits in order to work, and that's and that's okay. Uh, it's their choice, but it's important that they have the uh, the education to know how to make uh, those choices for themselves. And whatever choice they decide to make, it's okay. It's their choice, and we will support them with that choice. Okay. So on the issue of Medicaid, that we can transition now to the legislative agenda the disability community has at the Capitol. And um, one of the issues that I know has been talked about for a few years now is Medicaid expansion. Um, so could you talk about why that's important? And I think the figures that we've heard uh, Medi Medicaid expansion could affect upwards of or close to 600,000 people, I think. But anyway, could you talk about that? Well, in Georgia, you know, there's a, a number of people that uh, uh, would be supported by uh, the Medicaid expansion. Uh, right now, we're we're just talking about people being covered by medical care. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Medicaid expansion does is supports people with disabilities uh, to live, like you were talking about earlier, with lowest in the, the least restrictive environment. And instead of being in a nursing home, let's just say, uh, the people can live uh, on their own or live in the community. We know that, on the whole, uh, nursing homes are more expensive than uh, someone living in the community. The state would save, I remember the time, was something like $93 million by having people uh, that they knew of to live on their own. And that seems to be a lot of money to me. But uh, uh, the state turned it down because it was worried that in the future those funds would be gone. Um, so, when I say a least restrictive environment, it may be, let's just say there's someone like myself uh, who may need supports uh, to live at home. Uh, and um, that would support, uh, that would help the, the caregiver uh, uh, stay at home. In many cases, for instance, uh, not in my case, but in many cases, uh, that there may be a family member may uh, stop work to support uh, another family member. and. Um, 
to do that, um, that may mean that they're going to give up an income. Uh, so many people will use that those funds to support someone to live uh, uh, to live at home. Now, supporting that person with the, uh, some income is a lot less expensive than supporting the person with a disability to live in an institution, i.e. group home, nursing home, or something like that. So instead of paying that institution X amount of dollars, for a percentage of that, we can support a caregiver to support the person with a disability. And uh, without sounding too mean, uh, it's actually a lot uh, cheaper uh, for the state. I wanted to ask a question about wages. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I mentioned in the report I did that uh, servers, uh, that there's a, a, a tip wage. In other words, people who mm -hmm. get tips are penalized uh, <laughs> for that and are only paid $2.13 an hour in Georgia. Is there a, I'll use it, is there a disability wage? The, well, <laughs> that's kind of a, 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 tr a trick question. There has been, in the past, uh, wages for people with disabilities or jobs for people with disabilities where <clears throat> they're paid by the, uh, their production. Uh, so like piecework. Piecework. It is piecework. Yes, it is piecework. So uh, instead of paying, uh, let's say, ten dollars an hour, uh, people are paid by the piece, and it's uh, some institutions uh, uh, pay that way. Uh, one of the institutions happened to be Goodwill, which a number uh, a few years ago there was a number of protests. I have to mm -hmm. say, in Georgia, uh, the Goodwill did pay minimum wage. But uh, many throughout the uh, the country, Goodwill did pay piece work where people were being paid uh, as much as 25 cents an hour. Uh, so, and I say as much as jokingly, uh, while the uh, president, who happened to be a person who of uh, who was blind, uh, was paid well over a million dollars uh, a year. Wait a minute. The Goodwill CEO gets a million. Well, that that was that was then. <laughs> he was blind. I'm not sure if he's still the same person, but at that time, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, going back to the capital, you said uh, there's an independent living day uh, coming up. Can you talk about what that's about and what the agenda is? Thanks. There's a, actually there's a couple of uh, uh, in the assembly of the capital in here in Georgia. We have. Uh, uh, in, uh, disability Days at the Capitol, and they're sponsored by different organizations. Um, uh, the Blind Community has a Blind Day at the Capitol, there's a Transportation Day at the Capitol, there is a Senior Day at the Capitol. But some of the ones that we're talking about now is the uh, Georgia Council for Developmental Disabilities has uh, five days at the Capitol. Two of them happen to do with Medicare, um, one happens to do with uh, assisted. Uh, housing, uh, one has to do with post-secondary education, one has to do with edu uh, um, work, and I don't know if I named six or not, <laughs> but uh, uh, those are some of the different days. But uh, another day is Independent Living Day at the Capitol, which is February 8th, uh, which uh, we'll be talking about uh, independent living, uh, the philosophy, the nine different centers throughout Georgia plus the Statewide Independent Living Council, which is sponsoring this event, and that will be on the 8th of February. Uh, we're, we're asking, uh, uh, we have a couple different asks uh, for that particular day. And what was the issue about ex the SILS, the Centers for Independent Living, do they cover the whole state right now, or what's the plan for that? Well, uh, as I said earlier, there are nine different centers throughout the state of Georgia. There's almost 600 throughout the nation. In Georgia, um, I think there's what, 157 counties, 59 counties, something like that? Well, 50 of those counties are not covered by Centers for Independent Living. So, uh, so we were talking about earlier, um, Centers for Independent Living um, have some unique qualities. There's five kind of what we call core uh, services that we uh, support. That would be information referral, which means that people call in. Uh, mostly, uh, we'll refer them to an, uh, another organization, perhaps housing, perhaps education, uh, or something like that. 
Uh, there's um, independent living skills, which we uh, consider any uh, skill that will support you to live in a community of your own. It could be anywhere from learning how to balance your checkbook to learning about the new iPad uh, 10 or iPhone 10. Um, it, uh, we also do uh, advocacy, which is self-advocacy and system advocacy, which supports the people from advocating for themselves. It may be uh, talking to your landlord that your rent is too high uh, for self-advocacy to system advocacy, system advocacy where it may be going down to the legislator on at uh, disability days at the Capitol and talking about whatever uh, thing that you would like to. Uh, we also have uh, peer support, which I talked about earlier, which is our main uh, thing at, uh, for independent living. It's uh, one person supporting another person uh, because we're the experts in our own lives. Um, there's nobody that can tell you more about sitting in front of a mic being blind with you two guys than me. <laughs> so I'm an expert in something anyway, and many things, and mostly the, my own life. And last is uh, we have a transition, and that's transitioning from institutions such as uh, group homes, nursing homes, or whatever, to the community and participating in that community, as well as transitioning for youth, and that mostly is transitioning from high school to adult life. So those are kind of our five core things. There's many other things that we do, job counseling, um, uh, sometimes the support with transportation, um, learning how to cook a meal. There's a whole bunch of other activities that we have, but every center does those five, five things. And going back to your question, I thought I went kind of around that. Uh, in Georgia, there are 50 counties that uh, Centers for Independence does not serve. Or, uh, so what we want to do is to make sure that all of our Georgians are served uh, by Centers for Independent Living have those supports. And to do that, we're asking the state to increase its budget to uh, let uh, Centers for Independent Living at least put an extension in uh, those, those counties that we do not serve, and so that we can support everybody uh, uh, with uh, independent living. Okay, so with a couple minutes left, uh, in terms of resources, uh, if people want to know more or get involved, uh, could you recommend a couple? I know Disability <laughs> Link. This, well, of course, uh, for uh, Disability Link, which we can do our INR service, infant, uh, information referral, if that's what you want. You can call 404-687-8890. Uh, uh, you can uh, get us on the internet by uh, dialing in uh, disabilitylink.org. Uh, that's one word, disability link. Uh, and um, there's other peer-led organizations if you want to talk about a specific uh, disability that you may have or want to know more about, but you can call us at Disability Link and we can direct you to uh, those agencies. And one more, because this has been in the news and we've We've discussed it here about health care reform and the role that ADAPT played at the national level with some of the protesting, not just in D.C., but also here. Can you talk about ADAPT real quick? Uh, ADAPT, for those who do not know, is a uh, peer-led uh, organization uh, sponsored for and by people with disabilities. Uh, it practices... Um, um, Civil disobedience. Direct action. <laughs> direct, direct, action. Direct, direct action is civil disobedience uh, uh, as a, a method of co uh, communicating its wishes. Uh, ADAPT uh, has worked uh, closely with the uh, uh, Disability Integration Act, uh, which is a federal program, and it basically says that uh, people with disabilities have the right to um, uh, live in the community and that the uh, community-based services should be the first choice. Uh, what happens right now, the first choice for funds and uh, people with disabilities is institution. So if something happens, uh, the first choice is putting them in a hospital or nursing home or something like that. But uh, we know that the best outcome, the best health, uh, the best uh, bang for our buck, we should say, is people living in the community. Uh, I can't think of a, a person today that would say to their 
uh, daughters or son, please put me into an institution or can I stay home? And so what we're saying is that on the DIA, uh, uh, Disability Integration Act, uh, we would like to the federal government to make that the first choice and with the CFC, Community First Choice Act, uh, that also says it's kind of the same thing. Well, thank you, Ken. I found this to be super uh, informative, and we've had Ken on before, and we're sure to have him on again. And so uh, thanks to both of our guests, Marka and uh, Ken, for being on today's Labor Forum. Please do tune in again next Monday, 4 to 5. I think we're going to talk about the Agnes Scott Speaking Living Wage. Speaking of Living Wage. I think we're going to talk about Agnes Scott's Living Wage campaign, among some other things. So I hope you found today's program informative, and stay tuned for all the programs here at WRFG. It's Diane and Paul and Ozzie and Christopher and Ken saying goodbye for today. Bye-bye.